enhanced over time. Uh, the tongue is one of two places on the body with the highest density of uh, somatosensory or touch nerve fibers. And uh, due to the type of tissue and the presence of saliva, it's uh, very easy to stimulate those uh, fibers electrically. The uh, product that we're actually developing is an orthodontic retainer with an electrode array uh, built into it um, that stimulates the tongue in response to audio. Very similar to a cochlear implant, but simply uh, stimulating the lingual nerve. The sensations actually feel like patterns of vibrations on your tongue. And initially, these can be very useful for situational awareness, um, such as detecting when someone's speaking to you or if there's an ambulance passing by you and just kind of general auditory situational awareness. Over time, uh, the user can actually differentiate specific tones and patterns and can differentiate different words. Uh, the best way to think of how this works is kind of like Braille, uh, but for sounds and on the tongue. Uh, Braille being a tactile language, you get the information through the somatosensory fibers of your, of your hands. Um, currently, we have three issued U.S. patents. Uh, we have a few uh, publications, uh, a couple peer-reviewed manuscripts, and a couple uh, uh, thesis, um, uh, master's theses through projects we've sponsored at CSU. Um, we have a new prototype designed for infants that's ready for kind of preclinical studies. Um, additionally, we've re launched uh, two related products that are um, in the direction of, uh, you know, tasks and challenges we have to solve for the uh, tactile hearing aid, um, but are, are um, for uh, different markets. Um, the two products we released are the Cthulhu Shield, which is a neuroscience research tool. It's a $75 alternative to a uh, $5,000 device and it's currently available in the US and Japan. Um, we've sold about 200 of these units uh, to date since last year when we launched them. Another product we're working on that we've spent a lot of time on the past uh, uh, 12 months or so, we're launching this summer, and it's a tongue-operated computer mouse for people with high-level spinal cord injuries. Um, essentially, it lets a uh, user control a cursor and click on their screen uh, just by dragging their tongue across the roof of their mouth. We see, uh, we, we believe we have a very strong technical team and that and our robust patent for portfolio is uh, some of our strong strengths. Um, we currently don't have an audiologist involved in the upcoming studies we have this fall. And so we're looking to uh, involve someone and recruit someone to help us with those. Uh, we actually see big opportunities moving forward in applying some of the, on one of these related products, applying the um, solutions we're developing for the people with high-level spinal cord injuries um, for the computer mouse product and applying those to specific industries and consumer products in the hands-free technology, uh, specific industries where people are doing other things with their hands, such as uh, uh, aviation, underwater welding, that kind of thing, as well as consumer applications such as virtual reality and uh, augmented reality. Um, regulation is always a challenge, and we've had the same uh, threats due to the uh, COVID-19 that everyone else has had, uh, one of which is our uh, uh, global supply chain. We uh, had some rough les lessons in that the past few months, and we're taking steps to uh, improve that and make that more robust. Um, key team members include myself. I've got seven years uh, research and develop experience, both in uh, the academic setting as well as in industry through consulting I've done with other companies and startup the past few years. Uh, Dr. Leslie Stoneroy is a neurobiologist at Colorado State University and a collaborator of ours and our key scientific advisor. Darren Buttemeyer has been running the, he's our uh, head of manufacturing and distribution and he has been running uh, one of the largest full service orthodontic labs in the US for the past 20 years. Um, we are, we're looking to ramp up sales of our related products, the, uh, primarily the uh, computer mouse product um, between now and 2022. And uh, at which point we believe we'll be ready to license the um, hearing aid technology to a, de a medical device manufacturer. We're looking to raise about 300,000 this year for about 60% of that's going towards R&D and about 40% of that going towards marketing and operations for the uh, existing products we have. And we would like to return about two to four X to our initial investors um, by 2022. Um, I'd love to get your feedback on this presentation and how effectively I was able to communicate as well as uh, anybody who would like to learn more, uh, please you know, uh, get in touch with me and I'd love to talk more about this. Um, thank you so much for your time. I'd love to answer any questions you have.
Fantastic. Thank you, JJ. I appreciate that very much. Um, also, uh, adore the name Cthulhu Shield. Really do. That's going to be fun for me. Okay, so first pieces of feedback coming in in the chat, but if you have uh, questions or comments, please just raise your hand and we'll go through that. Uh, Kristen has hers on mute due to bandwidth issues, so she was hoping, JJ, you might talk a little bit more about your go-to-market strategy and how you sell products. Sure. So for the um, for our current product, we have or the one that we're launching this summer. Um, we form pretty good relationships with uh, the, the assistive technology department at Craig Hospital, and we intend to do that to the other 70 spinal cord rehab centers in the U.S., um, as well as attend uh, some key uh, industry conferences or if they're still going on. Uh, we've also formed a partnership with a uh, company called Quadstick that's given us access to 700 of their customers in North America. And so between now and 2022, that's how we plan to, uh, you know, we're primarily focusing on growing our sales um, in the, uh, uh, for the computer mouse product. And uh, moving forward with the, in 2022, when we plan to license our, um, uh, the, the tactile hearing aid product, we're looking at a couple companies for that, uh, companies that manufacture cochlear implants, as well as a uh, bone conduction implants. And uh, we're interested in licensing that out just because we believe that they're going to be more capable of um, getting it to the end users and uh, uh, marketing it more effectively. Fantastic. Thank you. Carl? Yeah, so congratulations on getting us all to be running our tongues across our roof of our mouth trying to figure out, so like, could this work as a mouse? This, what I, cool idea. Um, the thing that I struggled with was um, knowing um, you're, you're throwing sort of a lot of new concepts at us and they're not really complicated, but they're a lot different than what we've seen. And so the idea of, okay, um, a computer mouse, right, that's one idea, but that I, I don't understand the connection between that and hearing through the tongue. Um, sounds like two different um, efforts. Yeah, maybe you're using some of the same technology, but it would be hard to um, imagine that you could spread yourself that thin at this stage to say, oh yeah, our, our company does this and it does this. Um, so that's sort of part of what I was struggling with, um, you know, maybe a, a roadmap um, or something to tie the two together to say, here's why it makes sense to do this and then do that. Um, it's a logical extension, something like that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'll definitely include that. And we do, um, as far as the manufacturing challenges and the customization challenges, we did feel that essentially we had to do everything we needed to do for the computer mouse and implement all of those manufacturing techniques um, as well as the, uh, um, the wireless communication um, for the tactile hearing aid. And we just kind of stumbled on the uh, um, application of being able to use it to sense the position of the tongue in the mouth using the exact same hardware. And so you're absolutely right. It is a totally different market. Um, and yeah, I'll definitely uh, thank you for the idea about the roadmap. Yeah. I, if, because this is in um, inside the body, is the uh, government regulation like really, really onerous? Uh, absolutely for the tactile hearing aid. Um, it's so for the computer mouse, that's actually not an FDA regulated product. Um, if we were to make some sort of claim that it ameliorates a, a medical condition or a disease, um, then we would, um, it, it's all about how you market it. Uh, the tactile hearing aid, absolutely a lot of regulation, which is why we're looking to, uh, which is, which is why we're looking to um, license that to an existing medical device manufacturer. But the computer mouse, if we, um, if we do it the way we want to, it actually is a, a lot less regulation. Okay, thank you. Great. Chris, you had a question or comment? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I would just, um, you know, sort of uh, second what Carl was saying. I, I think just, you know, for investors especially, 
that roadmap is going to be really important. And, you know, how do these products, how does it fit together in, in time, you know? Um, and, and I just had one just small nitpicky thing for me. I would just love it if uh, your financial projections slide just put the actual numbers, you know, at the top you had like in thousands, you know, basically. And then uh, just, just give me the numbers because I don't, don't make me think about it, you know, kind of thing. But that's it. Um, I thought it was a great presentation and I think your technology is very cool. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about this. I'm curious if you've connected with hear me technology down in Longmont uh, because they might have some connections to audiologists that you would be able to use. There are a group of guys who are developing a hearing aid uh, and talking piece for Parkinson's disease. Oh yeah. You said that was hear me technology. Yep. And I can help connect you with them. They were part of the pitch no co competition last year. With yeah. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. And we did have one question pop up in the chat. Uh, could you describe what your ideal investor would be, JJ? Yeah. Um, our ideal investor at this stage would be somebody who has a, I mean, we're, we're looking for angels right now. Um, somebody with a personal interest in the, uh, in the uh, technologies. Um, and uh, we're looking for, you know, investments. Uh, we're looking for about 20 to 30 investors of, you know, upwards of uh, $10,000 per investment. Um, we'd like to keep it as local as possible too. Okay, great. Thank you. Any last comments or thoughts for JJ this morning? Great. Please be sure that you are popping uh, any additional comments you have or or connections into the chat to either JJ privately or open to everybody else. Oh, and Natalie, let's catch you real quick. Uh, yeah, sorry, just a formatting question on your uh, financials, JJ, the last two years didn't say 2014, mm -hmm. 2024, 2025, it says 2024 and 2025. It's just a formatting oh. thing. So if you use that, just be careful. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, I missed that, thank you. <laughs> yeah, not a big deal, but you don't want to show that to an investor. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, great. So we're going to move on uh, fairly quickly here this morning to our second presentation because we've given Bill just a little bit more time this morning. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with Bill and the SAGE program, he's going to be presenting one of our local resources for startups here. So we're going to give him, instead of just six months this morning, we're going to give him about eight or nine uh, with some follow-up on that kind of stuff. And our fun fact about Bill. Uh, Bill went into the family business of aeronautical uh, engineering um, and has worked very hard to make sure that his background of his Zoom call has various fun things in it for us. So please, Bill, go right ahead. Bill, I can't hear you. Okay, how about now? There we go, thank you. All right, there was two mute buttons here. So uh, <laughs> let me share my screen. But first of all, uh, if you look above my head, um, that is an airfoil section uh, made out of wood. My father made that in high school. Back in the 1930s, they actually did stuff in high school. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, that got me excited about going into aerospace engineering. And so that, that's kind of one of my fun facts. My other fun fact is if you look down to my right shoulder, um, Jana immediately pointed out, I've never seen a phone like that. Everybody see that phone? Yep. <laughs> yeah. That phone doesn't work. That's an antique. But anyway, uh, that has a long story that goes with it too. Uh, a family treasure. So uh, anyway, those are some fun facts. So anyway, I'm going to start my timer. Um, so I know uh, I can tend to be verbose, particularly on things that I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to start my uh, screen share and bring up my slide presentation. Um, let's see, can everybody see that or? Yes, sure can, Bill. But you're seeing the whole thing though, right? It's not. Yep. Um, uh, you yeah, just yeah. got to hit the slideshow button. 
Yeah. Um, it's hidden by the. Uh, oh, the Zoom menu is hiding yeah, it for I, you? Yeah, I got to get rid of my other Zoom stuff here so I can get to that. It's always fun doing it in front of, you know, 30 people who are watching you do it as well, which has been okay. my favorite thing about Zoom meetings right. lately. So we're cool now, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, you're great. All right. So anyway, uh, so one of my objectives today is to, uh, is to make sure everyone in the audience learns something. And there are many people who, uh, have heard the term sage but don't know what sage means and so my very first slide gives you the opportunity to learn something about what does sage actually mean it's social and advisory group for entrepreneurs so anyway i want to thank everyone for uh, the opportunity to uh, for me to give an update uh, sage has been around for 13 years now so this is not a new organization um, and my ask today is um, I'm going to talk about what SAGE does in normal times. I'm also going to talk about how COVID has changed that. And um, I'm also going to ask people um, about signing up to help. So anyway, that's my ask. Um, and um, my presentation is divided into three parts. So I'm going to spend about three minutes, four minutes on who is SAGE, what do we do, um, in normal times. And then I'm going to shift over to uh, kind of COVID-19 things, talk a little bit about our portfolio, our founders, you know, what some of their struggles are. I think this is going to be universal to startups in general. So you may find some very um, interesting things there. And then I'm going to talk about a few of the things that we are doing, um, we meaning Sage, um, to kind of mitigate or to uh, help out in that situation. So let's, let's start with the why Sage. So Sage got uh, started, as I said, back in 2007. And it's interesting that um, it, it was really in response to the dot-com um, bust. Now, some of you are too young to remember the dot-com bust in 2002, but it turns out in 2007, the effects of that um, economic downturn were still being felt, in particular to Fort Collins. And so in Fort Collins, many primary jobs were lost. Um, this was due to a downturn. Uh, HP had many engineers, Agilent and more and so on. So there were a lot of talent basically floating around in Fort Collins. There was also a big need and a big drive by the city of, by the city of Fort Collins. Oh, okay. Um, at that time to create new primary jobs. And at the same time, interestingly, um, there were a lot of startups. And so, so Sage really came together as, a, as, as, a, as really the, the nexus of those, of those three things. Um, so I'll move on here. So what exactly does Sage do? So we provide early stage entrepreneurs with short-term help. Um, they need to move their business forward. The way we do that is we connect people who need help, entrepreneurs or founders, to a pool of advisors who want to help. So that's, that's, that's what we do at a high level. Um, we provide pro bono services. We're an all volunteer army, so to speak. Um, and to date we've connected or we've worked with um, 162 founders and um, since 2007. And today we have actually two venues, one in Fort Collins, one down in Boulder. We manage this really as one group, um, but we do have two venues. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, we meet in Fort Collins every first Wednesday in the morning and um, in Boulder. Um, I have to move my screen around here. <laughs> uh, on Wednesday of the third, uh, every third Wednesday in the afternoon. So what kind of startups do we work with? Let's talk about startups and let's talk about advisors because that's really what we do, we connect. So we're not too picky um, in terms of who we work with. I mean, we, we do B2B, we do B2C, uh, venture funded, bootstrap, lifestyle. We don't try to cut you know groups out. Um, I don't know if I've ever turned down an industry. So I'm gonna say most, but um, it, uh, it, uh, we, we've never really turned anybody down. So, so the, probably the biggest thing that uh, we, distinguishes us is that typically there's gotta be some new technology somewhere or some new innovation, uh, building something new. So if someone's gonna do some retail, 
um, we would send them to someplace like SBDC or something like that. So, so that's, that's kind of a higher level. So let's talk about the advisor side. Um, right now we have about 135 active advisors. This, this number has stayed steady for the last 12 years. It's kind of interesting. And you'll see these two pie charts, which show, um, you know, what the backgrounds of these advisors are. You know, on the left, you can see many of them were software or electronics, bioscience. On the right, you can see what companies they, they kind of came from. So we have a pretty wide, um, uh, you know, uh, spectrum of people and where they've come from. Um, most of them have a lot of experience. Um, in the early days of Sage, most of the folks were um, I would say at, at, the, at the mid to tail end of their, um, uh, their employment with big companies. Today, I think we're a little bit more diverse in terms of having um, younger folks and different, different skills with us. So where do we fit? So I know this comes up a lot um, in uh, discussions, even at One Million Cups. There's so many places today um, that help startups people are somewhat confused as to, to where they fit. So what you see here is kind of a, a hypothetical um, startup cycle, everything from the idea on the left to a full-blown scale up $1 billion IPO on the right. And so universities tend to help out on the, on the front end of this cycle, you know, accelerators, incubators, um, uh, angels, VCs work kind of at the, at the other parts. And, you know, Sage's sweet spot is really um, this intermediate group. So there's some overlap at, at the lower, at the, at the beginning of the cycle, there's some overlap at, at the latter stage of the cycle. And so when clients come to Sage, oftentimes I send them to the left or I send them to the right, depending on where they fit, right? And so this is kind of an ongoing thing. So how does the process work? Um, so startups apply, there's an application, which I'll, I'll give you a point or two later on. We have a screening process. We don't take everyone. Um, every month we select two new startups, one that presents down in Boulder, one that presents in Fort Collins. Um, they go on stage once a month. There's an audience of uh, 30 to 35 advisors. Advisors then um, express their interest in working with that startup. We put a team together and then that team works together with that startup for roughly six months to 18 months um, in what we call an engagement. So um, that's kind of how uh, Sage works. So let's kind of shift a little bit to what does our current portfolio look like today? And um, I often get the question from people, why do you do this, Bill? Um, and I, I really do it because of the pictures that you see in this slide, right? Th these are the current founders who are part of our, the Fort Collins cohort. And we have a, essentially an equal number of these down in Boulder. Um, these are all founders. And today we have 12 startups in our portfolio and I've kind of color coded those. So even within the Sage zone, some are earlier, some are kind of mid, and, and some are actually in revenue. And so that's what the, what the, um, the, 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 the color codes are. And so uh, many of these people on the right, you should recognize, most of them have presented at 1 million cups. And to give you a, a, an, a, an inkling about the diversity of the types of people we work with, you can see um, what the businesses are. So oral mobility, I think they've already presented, but they're in the car sharing business. Um, for suburban developers. This is, a, this is our newest client. Uh, Dastrap, this is Karthik, he presented a while ago. Outsmart, you know, a weather app for concrete uh, construction people. Gyrotech, uh, these guys are from the University of Wyoming. Uh, they're in the hemp tracking tools, uh, hemp tracking business. And um, I'll just show the others and, and just to show you what the, what the uh, what the broad range of startups are. Um, Quorum, I think Quorum presented at One Million Cups not long ago, a really neat application of, of um, a new amputee uh, prosthetic device um, and um, so on and so forth. So, um, so let's talk about COVID now. So 
COVID ha has had a huge impact on all of us. Um, and what I have been spending a lot of my time in the last month on is taking a look at these 12 companies and to try to find out how can we or what do we need to do to help them now in these COVID times. So the first thing I started to do was put together a, um, an assessment. And so what you see along that axis is those three buckets that I, I showed you in the previous slide. So early stage, um, mid stage, meaning they have an MVP, and then latter stage, um, they're in revenue. And I try to determine, um, what is COVID having a big impact on them? And, and the impact could be positive actually, or it could be negative. And then I, I sorted the 12, um, portfolio uh, companies in our portfolio, you know, into what looks like a competitive analysis slide. Now I should, I should tell you that this is a work in progress and each of the teams that are working with these 12 clients are actually um, drilling down in more detail to find out, you know, what the true impacts are. And it turns out it's not, it's not a digital answer. Yes, there's a plus or, no, it, or, or yes, it's minus. In most cases, there's some things about a business model that are plus, with COVID and some things which are minuses. So, so, so this is gonna change over the next couple of weeks. And the reason we're doing this obviously is to change our approach of working with these 12 uh, clients. And so, and what I'm showing you here is just how the 12 um, startups in our portfolio kind of mapped. And it's just kind of interesting that, um, you know, about half of them are, could actually benefit if they do the right things with with the COVID situation. Um, some of them really need to figure out how to pivot and that's kind of what we'll be focusing on in the coming months. Um, and so some of the, here's some of the responses that we are, um, have already done and are in the process of doing from a SAGE perspective. So we held an, a listening session with all of our clients um, last week, April 22nd. And um, just to find out, you know, what, what's going on from their perspective. And, you know, we all talk about runway and normally runway is, is associated with um, resources. They're running out of resources. But what I'm finding is that there's also another kind of a runway. I'm going to call it psychological runway. So, so, you know, being in a startup business is really hard. We all know that. But throw COVID into the into the equation, and it's getting really, really hard. So I'm very concerned for some of our startups about what I'll call the the psychological or the emotional runway. You know, are they uh, reaching that point? So anyway, the, the second bullet um, we're, as I mentioned, working on new business plans and pivots. Um, the third and fourth billet, another interesting thing is I've gotten several requests from CSU and we've also got requests from CU about the number of startups um, which they're experiencing coming to the Institute for Entrepreneurship. We know about that group, uh, CSU's business school. And so they're asking for advisors and mentors to help them um, work with, with folks um, at CSU and CU. So we all know that those schools are not, uh, they're in session, but they're all um, trying to do this remotely. Um, and so the, the other thing I should mention is that all of our meetings and found, uh, founder sessions and, um, and screening, everything is done obviously uh, virtually today. Um, so, so I think I'm running out of time here. So I just wanted to let you know that, you know, Sage does not live in a vacuum. And we all know that there's a, uh, an ecosystem. Um, and uh, I just wanted to show you what that ecosystem looks like from a Sage perspective. So each of these organizations might draw it a little differently. Um, but um, we're part of a, a much bigger startup ecosystem in Colorado, Wyoming, and, and so on and so forth. So anyway, here's my, my ask is if you know anyone that you think might be ready for a Sage um, engagement, you know, from a startup perspective, you know, here's the website. Um, uh, Susan Strong is my counterpart in, Loveland, in, uh, in Boulder. So you can email Susan or Bill at Innisphere.org. Uh, Innisphere is um, a major sponsor of uh, Sage. Um, if you know someone who wants to be an advisor, here's another website on the Innisphere webpage. Once again, same emails, let us know. 
So anyway, thank you. And uh, I hope that um, all of you learned something new, either about Sage or about what we're finding, um, you know, with our startups uh, due to COVID uh, and so on. So uh, thanks again. And uh, back to the ask slide. So was, uh, did you, um, was the message clear about what we do in at least normal times? Um, did you get enough information maybe to make a referral to one of your colleagues or acquaintances? And maybe you're ready to sign up yourself to either get help or give help. So anyway, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate that. Um, I think the first question I have for you right off is, it's been several years since I've been to a SAGE meeting um, and it was very much the HP refugees uh, kind of group at the time. So if we are, if you're looking for recommendations uh, for advisors, what are the expertise areas that you most see the need for? Yeah, I think, I think what's changed, and that's a good point. You know, when we started this off, I mean, probably 90% 90, 90 were HP Agilent. And I would say that, that uh, today it's more, um, it's still maybe 40% maybe um, of the old crew. Um, and um, what we're seeing now, in the old days, we saw more projects that were hardware, had hardware and software associated with the hardware. Today, I would say half of what we're seeing are software apps. And so we're definitely looking for uh, more software people, um, people who are more familiar with developing apps on, on you know, cell phones or in, you know, in addition to PCs and so on. So I would say software is a big deal. Um, but great question. Great. Okay. Other comments or feedback for Bill this morning? Carl, why don't you start us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Bill. And uh, I've been involved with Sage for a number of years, so um, this is great to be uh, getting the additional visibility. Uh, for what Bill said about uh, getting software people, I agree. Um, the other thing that I might uh, point out in my mind is that the landscape of entrepreneurship is significantly different than it was five or 10 years ago. And so people who have been navigating that recently. Um, I, I'd love to have more advisors who have been doing that. Um, but th the other thing that um, may not have been so obvious for people, um, there's a lot of visibility on these presentations that these entrepreneurs give to uh, the advisors and that those are great and they happen monthly and it's fantastic. But the real value comes in uh, setting up these advisory working teams that can be working with these entrepreneurs for six months, 12 months or whatever, uh, uh, quite a long time. Um, the team that I'm on right now, uh, we're doing some great work with the guy because one of the things that he was really struggling with is how to na navigate the pandemic universe because the first response was, oh, my business is like totally falling apart and I'm going to have to put it on hold for what the next year. I don't know. And then it turns out that he has people who are switching from in-person conferences to online conferences in the wake of the pandemic. And so there's actually a lot of opportunities and he is in the process of signing up new clients as a positive out of this. So, so that chart that Bill showed about, um, how much people are impacted positively and negatively, that sucker is changing on a daily basis. Right, right. And that's, that's why I had to add work in progress because yeah, as, totally. you know, I'm, I'm working with the leads. E each of the teams has a lead associated with it. And, and so I've asked them essentially to tell me where they are on that chart and how they're going to get to move them. Hopefully we can move all of them up right, to the positive impact, or at least get them to the neutral level. Some of them are not going to be impacted that much, but, it, you know, they're all going to get impacted because time has stopped. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, probably the least impact is you've lost three months, maybe six months. That, that's probably the, the least impact. But most of the impacts are, you know, my clients are gone or my clients have shifted. 
Um, you know, people will never come to a conference in the next year, so I'm going to have to virtualize things and so on. The, the other, uh, I just was thinking too, one of the other big changes in terms of we need people who understand software apps is marketing. Marketing has changed drastically, probably more so than R&D, you know, in the last 15, 20 years. So digital marketing, SEO, all those things, um, you know, we, we need some more help there because we have lots of marketing people, but they have not used many of these new tools. So, so we're looking for, um, you know, which, which, which tend to be um, younger people too. So we're trying to bring the average age of our advisors down as well, just because it has more to do with, you know, what their skill sets are. Great. Any other comments or feedback? I know for me, um, Bill, you mentioned who you're currently working with, but Sage has been around for some time. Do you have an idea of the total number of companies that Sage has worked with? It's 162. I had a, it was on one of my slides. Uh, we, we've worked with 162. Uh, and uh, so in May, in May, and we have a Sage meeting next week, that'll be 163, so. Fantastic, uh, great. No, it's, it's been, and, and to go back to your comment about Hear Me, Hear Me is a current Sage client in Boulder. So they're in our, in our, uh, in our uh, cohort in Boulder. Yep. So, and that's Steven. a great connection. Yeah. So, so sa the Sapien guys need to connect. Yeah. All right, Stephen, you have comments? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw out a quick plug for Sage. I worked with Sage for a few years um, as an advisor. Um, I had to step away uh, for business reasons, but um, just as sort of a now semi-independent source, these guys are really great and uh, they really offer a lot of expertise and a lot of value to business owners and entrepreneurs. So if you're, if you're in a place or you know somebody in a place that they need that kind of early stage help, um, it never hurts to call and, and you could get some really valuable resources. Uh, so I just wanted to plug it. Appreciate yeah, thanks, that. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah. Natalie, your turn. Um, yeah, hi, thanks uh, Bill for the presentation. So um, yeah, I've been an on and off Sage advisor sort of depending on the time that I have available and for the million cups reasons, it's always been hard to attend the meetings. Uh, but what I wanted to say was, uh, you know, you've provided some feedback about what the Sage advisors do, the companies where they're at. And I think that, uh, you know, there's 162 companies, as you said, it might be interesting to get feedback from those people as well. What did they actually get out from you know get get from their their sage advisors what how it helped them over the you know over time i think it would also be a great you know sort of quote unquote publicity for for sage having both you know both perspective because uh, i know there's a, there's a lot of them that you know have that and it also helps them in stating concretely okay where where i needed that help when i started at sage this is what i got and this is what it really got me to do at the end of the day uh, and there might sometimes be a gap and it'd be interesting to look at that as well yeah, that's, that's a great comment, you know, and I was talking with one of our clients that, that we worked with uh, about two years ago the other day, just checking in, checking in with them and, you know, having that same discussion, you know, what was the biggest thing you got from being with the Sage guys? And it turned out that the comment, you know, initially I took it as a negative, but, but it was really a positive. And the comment was, you guys made me accountable and, and I, I, I finally figured out I wasn't ready to do this. I wasn't ready to throw in everything to be successful. And you guys helped me make that decision to shut this down, right? And so success comes in many different ways. And it's not always my business, you know, grew, you know. In many cases, the businesses fail, but next time around, they know they've learned a lot. So I, I, I think I can't underestimate the the, uh, the benefit of learning, both on the advisor side and, you know, the client side. And so it, it's hard to look at, you know, just who made it to a billion dollars. How many, how many unicorns did we generate, you know? Um, I'm not sure we've generated any unicorns, if, if you're familiar with that term. But, but I think, I, I, I think uh, some things can't be measured, you know? learning is hard but anyway yeah bill that's great and and quite frankly it's better that people get out before they end up too far and too deep uh, it's always a, a rough conversation but one that's important to have jen you have a comment 
Yeah, I want to say thanks, Bill, because I've heard Sage talked about um, in the various meetings uh, with with One Million Cups and other places. I didn't know, I really didn't understand. And so this really helped me get more of a clear picture of what Great. Sage does and, and with my service, not, you know, where in some place in my business I might be able to use Sage, so, or somebody else that I know. So thank you. Right, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill, I think the thing that you didn't maybe cover as much as I necessarily wanted um, was what do the advisors get out of being a part of SAGE versus just the ability to see and maybe work with companies? Are there other benefits to people becoming a part of the SAGE advisory group? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an all-volunteer army and no SAGE advisors get any compensation. I don't get any compensation, so it's completely volunteer. Um, and some people are very skeptical, me, startups, when I when I have that discussion because they go, "No, I don't believe you. <laughs> you're gonna, you know, you're going to get something." So, so what do people get? And and I mean, there is a tremendous amount of what I would call give back mentality. Um, volunteers tend to volunteer, you know. And when I go to my Sage advisors and I find out what else do they do, I find out they volunteer here, here, and here. So, 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 so partly it, it's, it's, it's that. Um, I, I think some of the other elements are learning. If you look at that portfolio and if you scan the topics in there, everything from hemp tracking to wearable uh, patient monitors, I know I learn a lot when I, when I, when I interact with them, when I screen them. You want to help them put their presentations together and then when the leads you know build their teams and take over i think it's the same thing people learn a tremendous amount the, the advisors learn a tremendous amount you know uh, so that i think that's a big plus you know and i think they just want the community to be to, to have more uh options you know in terms of primary jobs i mean i mean ultimately we'd like to create primary jobs and most of advisors have kids and they would like their kids to have opportunities to, to stay here if possible, you know, by having, having a stronger economy. So I think there's multiple, you know, and, but it's all intangibles. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. We appreciate it very much. So round of applause for Bill in that process. Uh, our last portion of the day uh, for the last eight minutes or so here, who's had a win this week? Who needs a little bit of help this week? Or who has a, a resource that they wanna share with the group? So I will start, I could actually use some help this week. I am looking for somebody who is an expert in a uh, online database platform called Airtable. I have exhausted the customer service folks in this capacity and I'm trying to get some things built for Launch NoCo. So if any of you happen to know Airtable experts, I would love to get connected with them and have a conversation uh, just to see if even what I'm dreaming of is even possible. So who else has something they'd like to share, uh, a win or anything else this week? Carl, you can start us off. Yeah, so I can probably give you an update because I think I uh, showed this to you. Well, I can't share the screen because you won't allow me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me do that. I had a picture here. It's pretty. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but uh, I've been working with my son on a board game and uh, the thing is coming to life actually. Uh, and so these, uh, the pieces on the board are actually little bottles that are filled with colored sand. And I was so impressed with the service that does that. Um, but it's really starting to take shape. If you look over on the right side, you'll, you'll see the dice that I have on order. Um, turns out that they are stuck in Hong Kong because the postal service is down over there. But, um, Anyway, uh, so one of the things that I can use now is uh, people who uh, have some knowledge on productizing that perhaps. I, it's not something that I have a high level of commitment to quite yet, but it's a possibility. Um, and I asked Brian about um, whether he had some pointers to um, people that know about patenting games. 
Um, so if people have um, information on how to patent something like that, that'd be fantastic. Fantastic. And actually, uh, you remember Pigeon with Liminal Operations? Mm. Okay. His a uh, couple of members on his particular team actually develop and sell their own versions of board games. So Sean on his team uh, would be a great connection for you. Okay. In the process. Fantastic. He's a huge game designer, and we'll probably have a lot of things uh, for you in that. Okay. Great. Stephen, what have you got to share with us this morning? Yeah, just just a quick note for everybody. Uh, Zoom has been in the news for the past few months because of alleged uh, security issues. You might have noticed that. Um, they did release Zoom 5.0 something with a long number on it this morning or last night, um, which is supposed to have a lot of security patches. So for people using Zoom a lot, it might be worth looking into. Just wanted to let people know. Good plan as uh, my entire life now takes place on Zoom, including my birthday party last week. It is the strangest thing now that it's something that we hardly used at all has become so ubiquitous in at least my day-to-day -day life uh, as I say hello to all of you. Anybody else out there with a win for the week? Anybody have good news for the week? There are 29 people on this call. If I can't come up with at least two more pieces of good news, I'm going to go into despair, people. Give me something. Uh, so we got another order for 50 of those Cthulhu shields from a company, so that was good. Fabulous. Ooh, very nice. I'm, I'm still not sure how I feel about you propagating Cthulhu in the world, but we'll let that go for Lovecraft later. <laughs> oh... Anybody else with a good win? Yep, Mike, I'm going to pick on you and Color Pocket then. Well, you'll, you'll get to see some of it next week when uh, there's a joint presentation by That's Color right. Pocket and Girls in the Spotlight, which will be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, we had a strange one, I guess. Uh, we got approached by Walmart of Canada Walmart Marketplace of Canada. So I had a discussion with them about how do we get our product into Canada, which is kind of interesting. So that's a, a new process, uh, just another thing to add to the plate to keep working through. But kind of now, fun. if you manage to work through that distribution portal, you may have to do a presentation solely on that because <laughs> I have heard so many a story of how interesting it is to get into Walmart. Yeah, it might be longer than six minutes, so we'll have to discuss <laughs> that. <laughs> Fair enough. Mr. Mike Bennett, what have you got for us this morning? So last night we were watching uh, Fox News and there was a, a friend of ours on uh, showing his new product, a stick to uh, social distance, the proper six feet. And it was R.T. Custer from Vortic Watch. Oh, wow. Really? R.T. Yes. was on TV last night. Yep. That's fantastic. I'm so glad to hear that. Okay. Anybody else with some good news for today? All right. Well, we are just a minute or two early, but we will go ahead and end up for today. We've got a couple of presentations for you next week, as you will see. Uh, and there are plenty of wonderful things going on out there. So make sure you take some time and connect with folks. And we will see you guys here again next week. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, Jenna. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good to see you all.